to this afternoon's public lecture, a series we're running as part of the AHRC funded project, Grief, a Study of Human Emotional Experience at the University of York. Uh, my name is Emily Hughes and I'm one of the postdocs on the project, working alongside Matthew Ratcliffe, Louise Richardson, Becky Miller and Eleanor Bohm. The overarching aim of this four year project is to develop a detailed and wide ranging and integrated account of what it is to experience grief. For updates on this project and upcoming talks, you can visit our website, griefyork.com, or follow us on social media with the Twitter handle at griefyork. So today we're delighted to welcome two speakers, Professor Karen West and Eve Wilson, who'll give a talk on supporting bereaved older people, evaluation of the bereavement supporter project. Karen West is a professor of social policy and aging in the School for Policy Studies at the University of Bristol. She's also a senior fellow of the NIHR School for Social Care Research, and her research is at the intersection of housing care and aging studies, and includes examining the ways in which specialist later life housing environments reproduce societal expectations of later life including those concerned with death, dying and bereavement. Eve Wilson is a project manager for Cruise Bereavement Support and has been managing the Bereavement Supporter Project for the last five years. She has previously worked as a commissioning officer for a local authority. Eve has over 15 years experience, both paid and voluntary, working with communities, older people and a range of charities, including a local bereavement charity. So this afternoon's lecture will run for approximately an hour with around 15 to 20 minutes afterwards for questions. So please note that the talk will be recorded, but the recording will stop before question time. So with that, I would like to warmly welcome Karen and Eve to speak with us. Thank you. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks, Emily. And um, thanks so much as well for inviting us to talk to you today about the evaluation. Um, just like to say sort of good afternoon to everybody and lovely to see so many faces. Thanks for joining us today. So we look forward to presenting for you and also taking your questions later. So firstly, I'm just going to try and uh, share my screen so we can display some slides. So just, just bear me a moment. Great. Great. Okay, fantastic. So, so we'll make a start. So as you're aware, we're going to talk about the evaluation of the Bereavement Supporter Project. I'm Eve Wilson from Cruise Bereavement Support. And I just wanted to start with giving you a bit of an outline of what we're going to cover over the next hour or so. So firstly, we're going to provide some background and context to the project and talk to you about the work that we've been doing. Um, Karen's going to talk a little bit about some of the conceptual frameworks as well that sit alongside the evaluation. And then we're going to have a discussion about the evaluation findings and learning. So initially we'll have some presentation slides and then we'll go, we're going to go on to have a conversation. So it'll be a mix of slides and um, not slides as well. So if anybody isn't able to really see the slides clearly, don't worry because there'll be a kind of discussion point as well. We will be talking about grief and bereavement. So I just wanted to sort of remind everyone really to keep yourself safe. You know, please do feel free to hide your photo or to take a break. If you feel you need to take a break, if it's something that you've heard, maybe something you need to step away from, then that's fine too. But importantly, you know, just a reminder around self-care. I think it's important that we just remember um, and thank everybody who's taken part in the project and the research and gave generously of their time. So a special thanks to those and also to the National Lottery Community Fund who are our funder for this project and piece of work. So we've been working for the last five years in partnership with another organisation called the Extra Care Charitable Trust. And I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about Cruz first for anybody who isn't familiar. So Cruise Bereavement Support, we're the largest national bereavement charity in the UK. We directly support over 60,000 people, bereaved people a year, through phone support, face-to-face -face support, and we also do group support. 
We have a universal offer. So we have a free national helpline. We have a website, lots of information and advice, and we have a web chat where people can log on and uh, talk in real time to a bereavement counsellor. And we deliver some of these services through our amazing team of over 4,000 volunteers. Most importantly, we provide support to anyone grieving following any type of bereavement, any circumstance and any length of time after the bereavement. So I think it's important just to share some of our experiences around grief initially to set some context um, for the type of work that we've been doing. So we know that grief is a really universal experience. Unfortunately, it's something that will affect all of us at some point in our life. But we know from all the work we've done with grieving people that everybody is different. And in fact, everybody grieves differently. So I often describe it as a like a fingerprint. It's quite unique. We'll all have our own ways of grieving. And actually, each bereavement, each experience of grief might be different. For those who can see, there's a quite, there's a sort of small little picture on the screen there of a straight line, which says this is how we want grief to work. In a linear fashion, we want a start and an end date almost. But we know, unfortunately, that isn't how grief works. It's often a lot more messy, a lot more complex. And there is no time frame for grief. So unfortunately, we can't say, oh, within a certain amount of time, we'll feel different or we'll feel better. Actually, that's quite unique and quite individual. There's no hierarchy in grief. We would never sort of compare someone's bereavement with someone else's as more serious or um, more major. In fact, everybody's experience is so unique that people will grieve individually for very different types of bereavement and in different ways. And finally, we would say that grief is not a disorder or illness. Although very painful, a very difficult experience, actually it's a natural healing process that is to help us to adapt to that major change that we've been through. So those are some of our sort of core um, learnings really and core understandings of grief from the work that we do at Cruise. So just to tell you a little bit about the Extra Care Charitable Trust, they're a fantastic organisation who provide um, not-for-profit housing for over 50s, so retirement accommodation, where people can live independently but they can also have care if they need it. They support over 4,400 older people in England across 16 retirement villages and five housing schemes. So with this project, what we've been doing is working together, Cruise and Extra Care, to look at how we can improve bereavement support for those older people, those residents who live in those um, accommodation settings. And we've done that for a number of reasons. So firstly, if we think about older people and think about bereavement, unfortunately, as we age, we experience loss and bereavement more frequently. And if we think about groups in society, I would say that actually older people are one of those groups that will experience multiple losses and more frequently than most of the groups. Quite often, older people will have fewer support networks at the time of bereavement. They may also have a major change in circumstance, such as something like moving home as a result of bereavement, which in itself can be a loss and can you know, um, cause somebody to have that experience of grief. But what we also know is that through research that older people are less likely to access support or be referred for formal services after a bereavement. There's lots of statistics around that. Actually, younger people, the younger generation, are more likely to be referred to those services or to gain access. So we identified there was an unmet need there in terms of older people grieving and their experiences of multiple experiences of grief. Now, while we're thinking about the setting of extra care and the experience of older people, it's also important that we think about the staff who work in those environments. So these are staff who quite often will get to know residents really well, will build relationships. So quite often after the death of a resident, they could be grieving themselves. They could be experiencing grief for the loss of that person. Extra care also delivers end of life care, which means that somebody can live in extra care and live well to the end if they're able to, which means that staff might also be involved in looking after somebody, providing care at the end of someone's life. So through those experiences and also through the fact that they'll be supporting residents who've had a bereavement, we thought it was really important with our project that we focus on both, both groups. So the model itself, the project is based on a peer support model. So what we've done is we've, uh, we've undertaken training of some of those extra care residents with crews to provide listening support to their peers. There's a photo there on the screen of some of our, some of our volunteers. So these are not paid counsellors, they're not people who necessarily have that kind of background. They're people who are committed to providing a listening ear to somebody who's had a bereavement. 
And as I said earlier, we know that older people are less likely to access bereavement support through formal services. So it's really important we look at how we could take support to residents in their own community. And this quote here, I think, sums up really nicely why and what the need is by Sonia, who's one of our volunteers. I'll just read that out in case anyone can't see that on their screen. We're all in it together here. There is lots of grief in different forms. To know someone is there to talk openly with is a very important service here in the village. So we've attempted to create bereavement friendly communities in each of these retirement settings. And we know from some of the information we've collected that over 1200 residents and family members have accessed this kind of bereavement support. We know that over 1500 residents and the wider village community have engaged with different types of activity, such as information sessions, workshops, talks, arts and poetry, to open up those conversations about grief. We've undertaken a, a training programme with staff to ensure that they've had staff around loss and bereavement awareness. But most importantly, what we've been able to do is remove barriers to accessing support, reduce isolation and improve signposting services so that we know that bereaved people can access support at the right time in the right place for them. And Karen's just going to talk to you now a little bit about some of the context around the evaluation of this five-year project. Thanks Eve, that's great. Yes, yeah, so I've chose this, 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 uh, these pie charts here that come courtesy of my colleague, Professor Liz Lloyd, um, who's a specialist in, in older, older age groups. And I think it just sort of echoes some of the things that Eve was saying really about the expectations that we have of people who are, who are grieving in later life. So if we look at the pie chart on the left, we can see that at the beginning of the 20th century, this is how death was distributed, you know, fairly evenly throughout the population. But by the end of, end of the 20th century, we can see that death and dying is overwhelmingly concentrated in the 65 plus age group and by inference also bereavement. Now, of course, that's not to say that people are not bereaved uh, when older people die. But I think in terms of thinking about spousal bereavement or close partner bereavement, bereavement is similarly concentrated very much um, on uh, older people. Um, so that was just one point I wanted to make. And I, Eve, could you do the next slide, please? Sorry, that's me trying to click on myself and realizing that I can't. <laughs> no problem. So, so I think that gives rise to a certain sort of cultural context, which I think, you know, is, is, is very important to understanding the kind of rollout of this programme of volunteer bereavement support within a context like extra care. Uh, that's very much about, you know, supporting people to live well to the end, but also, you know, it's, it's very much about active ageing uh, and so on and preventing um, ill health and also, you know, staving off the point of death uh, and, and bereavement. And I think this is captured quite well by uh, another colleague at um, Bath University, Malcolm Johnson, who's a social gerontologist who unusually specialises in death and dying. You would think that would be obvious as a social gerontologist, but so few people do. But I think he captures the situation quite well in this quote, so that, you know, although we're, we're experiencing this kind of longevity boom, uh, at the moment, we're not very good at actually helping people to live well, you know, spiritually uh, to, to the end of their uh, end of their lives. And I think we we don't take sufficient account often uh, of of the way that older people will experience uh, bereavement uh, and grief. And there's a kind of expectation as well that older people just kind of know how to deal with it because it's an older person's thing uh, that they will kind of automatically know and just be able to to, to get on with it. So it's some of those kind of cultural norms, I guess, in a way that the uh, that the project was trying to challenge, uh, in a sense. But but I think that sort of broader cultural change, you know, take takes a lot longer to achieve. Can you do the next slide, Eve, for me? Thanks. And I also just wanted to say something about the sort of policy context or the, the kinds of policies that are influencing the Extra Care Charitable Trust when they embarked on this project with Cruise. Uh, bereavement care. So I think for extra care, they have embraced the, I don't know if people are familiar with this gold standards uh, framework, but it's a framework, I suppose, that kind of 
superseded the the Liverpool Care Pathway, but it's but it's about it's it's a voluntary accreditation program to help organisations like Extra Care make sure that they really are attending to people's needs in you know until the very end of their lives, which of course includes bereavement as well as you know as, as thinking about palliative care. It also includes uh, bereavement. And, you know, often people in later life, you know, can, can become very isolated if they experience a bereavement in a context like a retirement village. They don't have anybody to talk to about it, perhaps, you know, withdraw behind uh, closed doors, end up becomes, becoming socially isolated, which then has a knock off on effect on, on their health uh, and well-being. So that's something that, you know, the Extra Care Charitable Trusts are very mindful of. Uh, and want to, to 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 counter partly through things like this, this the program with crews. I think what we're also seeing generally um, is a kind of move towards thinking um, in terms of compassionate communities or the so-called public health uh, approach to end of life uh, support. And again, you know, we typically think of this in terms of like palliative care, and the idea is that. You know, death and dying uh, and palliative care is not just um, an issue for kind of individuals within the confines of their families, nor, you know, just the business of specialist hospices and so on. But but it should actually be dealt with in communities, that community that death and dying and bereavement, by extension, is, is, is everybody's business uh, and communities should should be involved uh, in supporting people going through those um, through those processes, and I think the the um, the idea behind uh, the volunteer bereavement supporter program is very much informed by a, a paper, and Eve can say a bit more about this. Is by a paper that came out by the a report rather that came out from the National Bereavement Alliance in 2017 which argued that actually, you know, most people just need a bit of awareness uh, and information, a bit of signposting um, to uh, information um, in order to, to deal with uh, bereavement. Some people, on the other hand, could benefit with some sort of peer support. And that's where the, the idea of the compassionate communities really comes in, in that middle uh, banned there but in actual fact you know it's very few people that would require sort of intensive specialist uh, support you know talking therapies uh, and the like so I think really where where the the, the volunteer bereavement supporter uh, program sort of fits is, is in that is in that middle band there it's you know helping and enabling and facilitating communities uh, and peers uh, to support each other uh, through uh, through bereavement. I think that's all I wanted to say, uh, Eve. So um, the next slide, I think, is I think it's just our contact details. Right. Thanks, Karen. Yeah. yeah, those are our contact details um, because we're going to end the the presentation slide shortly. So just wanted to give people the chance to take our details down if they'd like to. Um, the evaluation report that we're going to talk about now is available imminently. So in the next couple of weeks, that will be shared publicly and you'll be able to access the full document and have a read Have a read too. So what we thought we'd do now is just talk through some of the headlines of that report, some of the challenges that we've identified and hopefully that'll generate some discussion and questions as well. So I'll just end this uh, stop share. Great, that's worked okay. So Karen and I were going to have a conversation now, really, um, because I think that would be the best way to bring to life some of the things that we've learned. So if you could start, Karen, by just telling us a little bit about your role in the evaluation. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Eve. So, so I, I led the evaluation um, with a team initially at Aston University, and then I moved to Bristol, and my, my colleague Rachel Shaw was also involved in that. Uh, and Katie Rolleston was the, the researcher and did most of the data collection, but, but I led uh, the evaluation. And we were interested in, in sort of four areas, really. We were interested in how the service was organised and delivered. We were interested in the quality of the training and the information that was delivered. We were obviously interested in outcomes for individuals, so that's to say residents, volunteers and uh, members of staff, but we were also interested, and it, this comes back to what I was saying earlier, we were also interested in some of the kind of wider impacts and the extent to which uh, the Volunteer Bereavement Supporter Programme helped to kind of develop 
um, enhanced grief literacy uh, amongst uh, residents and staff across the villages run by the Extra Care Charitable Trust and the extent to which it opened up, you know, better communication about death, dying uh, and bereavement, given, given some of these taboos and given some of these kind of cultural expectations that older people should just be able to sort of get on with it. Does that, it's a bit of a long answer to your question, Eve. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, I can't hear you, Eve. I think you're muted. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was just going to say, do you think there was any challenges there in terms of the um, evaluation and the kind of data collection side of the evaluation? Yeah, well, we, we, certainly, we certainly did have challenges. Um, I mean, there was, you know, there was never any way that this, we were going to be able to kind of do an evaluation in a standard sort of you know, kind of randomised control trial way. Uh, it just didn't really kind of lend itself to that because there are no sort of standard inputs. You know, the, the kind of support that uh, volunteers were giving to residents was, was very variable and actually was quite often difficult to capture. Um, you know, sometimes it could just amount to having, you know, a, 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 a very small, you know, um, brief chat uh, in the restaurant um, with, with a resident. It may have just been a kind of ad hoc fleeting sort of interaction. In other cases, it might have been more intensive and gone on for longer. So there was no sort of single input that we could kind of measure. Uh, and in terms of outcomes, similarly, uh, you know, very difficult to, to, to pin that down because, uh, you know, people, uh, people had different perceptions of, of, of the benefit uh, that they'd had from, from that volunteer input. So, so it, was quite, it was quite tricky in a way. So, we opted for a sort of case study methodology and a, and a qualitative approach to the evaluation so that we could kind of look at uh, the benefits for a range of different stakeholders. So that's, you know, that's the residents and the experience, their experience of volunteering uh, at the level of staff, uh, but also obviously also for, for those who had um, received uh, the bereavement support. Another huge uh, we sorry i should say that we did we we, ha we had a, a case study uh, methodology as well so we chose four of the um the sites uh in which the program was originally implemented and those were four of the extra care villages uh, in birmingham because we felt that it was also important to understand some of the kind of organizational context within which this program was was being uh, rolled out so that so there were some challenges to the to the evaluation at the best of times, but then of course COVID came along, <laughs> which was a huge challenge uh, to the evaluation, and it actually meant that we we weren't able to uh, follow up because we wanted to we we'd had designed a kind of longitudinal uh, program and data collection. But that was curtailed somewhat. We weren't able to go back to some of the uh, support recipients because of COVID, nor uh, the staff. But what we were able to do, uh, we were fleet of foot, I think it's fair to say, and we actually benefited for, from some extra funding from the University of Bristol, as well as Cruise itself. And we were able to um, mount a, a diary project um, throughout COVID, throughout the first six months of COVID, in which uh, the resident bereavement supporters diarised their experiences and told us about the kind of support uh, that they were giving to other residents and also were able to kind of just give us some kind of general insight about uh, the sort of bereavement that people were experiencing, not directly because of COVID, but, but during, uh, during the pandemic. So, so there were advantages and, and disadvantages challenges and, and benefits, I suppose, to the to the evaluation in the in the COVID context. And I think as well, what you said, um, Karen, about the difficulties collecting data is we did find that some of the volunteers themselves didn't always acknowledge that they were actually providing support. So when they yeah. were having informal conversations or they were doing a telephone check in with someone or they'd go and visit someone after a bereavement, they themselves weren't acknowledging that that was any kind of valued support. Yeah. And absolutely it was. Like I said earlier, it was about support at the right time in the right place. So it absolutely was valid um, and was very, very important. And I think during COVID, being able to use that diary methodology really helped to bring some of that kind of those nuances out. Because previously we tried to ask people to record data. 
They didn't feel able to do that, didn't feel able to recognise that what they were doing was support. But using the diaries really brought out that kind of rich, detailed accounts of what people were genuinely doing on a daily basis and how they were self-organising as well, Karen, you know, how they were organising themselves without any staff input as such. Absolutely, um, absolutely. So, so, so the staff uh, across the villages were, were very challenged, right? They were completely run off their feet. People were experiencing COVID-related uh, bereavement, but the the volunteer it was clear from the diaries that the volunteers took the initiative. Basically, they were able to kind of organise, and in some cases, they organised things like chains of, of telephone calls where they identified people who who were vulnerable, and organised a team of people to make sure that those people got a call at least uh, once a week. They provided, you know, very, very practical forms of support in terms of like making meals uh, for people uh, and so on, as well as just just being available um, to give appropriately socially distanced face to face to support, but also, you know, switching the kind of face to face support that they would normally give into telephone uh, support. So they really did take the initiative, and I and I think they supplemented really the kind of you know the professional care uh, that people would normally expect uh, in the villages because the staff just weren't uh, as as available i think what was really extraordinary as well that we learned we had some really powerful examples didn't we Eve, of the ways in which uh, the volunteers had organized memorial events as well across the villages so they'd organized um a funeral cortege to, to, to pass through the village and, and they, they, they printed up eulogies and uh, sang hymns and, and, and so on and so forth, which was, which was really quite remarkable in a way, because I guess one of the things that we, we sort of noticed in the villages, and again, it goes back to this kind of culture around death, dying and bereavement, was that the residents were often, you know, quite excluded uh, when when somebody dies uh, in the villages. It's you know, it's often the residents' families who get to know about it first. Residents aren't always in, informed, and they might be invited to the family funeral, but they don't have an opportunity to really kind of celebrate the life of their, you know, people who've been their friends and their close their close neighbours and they've not had their own chance to kind of organise their own memorial. So actually the pandemic gave them that opportunity to do it and it was the bereavement supporters that kind of rallied, rallied around uh, to do that. Yeah, um, I think for me as well, what it demonstrated is because we'd laid those foundations where we were having conversations about death, dying and bereavement and we were talking about grief and we were encouraging people to, to talk about it and talk to others. That then sort of laid the foundations for that real community based support, asset based type community development to happen without without any intervention. So almost it gave staff the opportunity to sort of step back. So normally with those types of services, there'll be somebody leading it or like myself, project managing. But actually, because we all kind of stepped back and took a step back, the volunteers took a step forward and came into that space and it almost gave them permission to self-organise which is exactly the right thing to do and exactly what we'd encourage communities to do like Karen talked about earlier that public health approach to actually being able to support those around you and only really needing a service when you're at the point where it needs to be you know a specialism um, and those examples of collected grieving you know the, the people coming together on the balconies or dropping off flowers to someone's front door and things like that I think were part of that bigger piece of work we'd already been doing to, to try and change that culture and empower people to feel that they can do that. They don't need permission to do that. They're able to, do, you know, they're able to do that themselves. So it was a really, I think it was a really, it was a really insightful piece of work, the diary research. And I think just showed us that actually what we were doing was so needed anyway. That the COVID almost showed that there was a need for what we were doing because, it, you know, it had to really mobilise. Um, and we wrote a report about that piece of work, which is also available, and we can share um, specifically about what we learned from from the diaries. Um, I wonder, Karen, if we can move on and talk a little bit about how the service was organised and delivered and what you found out, what you found out about that in particular. Sure. Yeah. OK. So so I think at the level of, um, you know, the, the sort of high level of the organisation, you know, the headquarters level, I think you know, there was a high level of buy in at the senior level uh, into the into the project and, you know, the pro project delivery team obviously made huge efforts to ensure that you know there was proper rollout across the villages 
But I think in terms of the villages, I, I think the experience was, was variable. I think where there was a clear and identifiable project champion, I think the service worked well. And that project champion could, could act as, as a bridge, if you like, between the volunteers and the health and wellbeing uh, and care staff. Uh, and the volunteers were, were well regarded and they felt empowered to take their own initiative and you know, volunteers have the respect of the staff. But I think in certain places, it's fair to say, I think Eve, and you can comment on this, that, that actually the programme didn't work quite as envisaged. There wasn't quite that level of buy-in from staff. And, and that could be for a variety of reasons. I mean, you know, let's face it, they're care staff, like any other care staff, are, you know, are really, really busy people. You know, they're, they're worked very hard indeed. And, you know, this you know, and, and sometimes these initiatives just kind of drop into their sort of work program and it's difficult for them to really uh, to really commit to them. So I think in some in some cases it didn't quite work um, as uh, as uh, envis envisaged. And I think it, this kind of relates to what we were saying before, in a way that I think we realise, you know, that changing these kind of mindsets about how you kind of communicate death and illness ac across the villages was something you know, that will take a bit longer to, um, you know, to, to change, as it were. There are some quite um, entrenched practices, uh, let's say, uh, around that. But, you know, where, where the, there was a clear and identifiable project champion in the villages, then the volunteers certainly felt uh, valued uh, and, and empowered. Where they didn't, they were sometimes a little bit frustrated uh, that they didn't get told about the death or hospitalisation of residents that they'd been supporting uh, and so on and so forth and felt that perhaps their skills and uh, experience was perhaps slightly undervalued by by the sort of professional uh, care staff but that you know that was by no means everyone's uh, experience. Yeah and I think what we also um what we also found in some locations where it did work really well is that actually the volunteers were there to help almost support the staff. So in the, you had a couple of locations where it worked particularly well, you know, and staff were able to identify people who'd been bereaved and maybe isolated or quite lonely and were able to match them with a volunteer to be able to kind of help, you know, help them through, help them through that journey, that grieving journey. And that's where it could work quite well. And as Karen said, with staff being really busy, you know, it's almost an additional service that's there then for residents. And we know from working with older people as well, how much they valued having like a peer to talk to as opposed to always necessarily a, a member of member of staff. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. And the locations where it didn't work as well. I think also that was about kind of attitudes towards bereavement mm -hmm. from a staff perspective, which is really important to consider when you're working with any kind of large organisation, because we're all different, we're all human, we we'll all have different experiences of bereavement and grief, we we'll all have different beliefs. And it was really important that we offered that training and awareness to staff because certainly when I started working in some places with some staff, some staff, not all, but some staff were reluctant to have those conversations about death, dying and bereavement because they felt that they might be upsetting for residents or they might be something that residents didn't want to do. And actually it was really important to kind of open up the space to allow there to be a choice because actually there were residents who wanted to talk and come into groups and share their experiences. There were residents who wanted to Kind of explore that a little bit more as part of their living well you know they're quite aware some residents that that may be their last home you know and they wanted to have those conversations about how that felt and you know how they felt about that stage of their life so I think it's really important as well that we worked to support the staff as well with that that kind of attitudinal change yeah absolutely and just just to say there that that, that, that my comments about the kind of organization relate to just the four case studies that, that that we looked at eve obviously has you know the wider kind of appreciation of, of, of the program but also when it comes to uh, thinking about the training and the information we we were we had much more data so we had data from across uh, the range of villages that were involved uh, in the project and, and we had some some great data um, uh, feedback basically from uh, from the training and information sessions. Do you want me to say something about that now? Uh, yes, that'd be great. Eve. Thanks, Carla. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so I think what we found that I mean, in a way, I think that's the big success story uh, of the program is is the training and, and information programs, and it was very highly rated by staff at all levels of the organisation. So it wasn't just 
care and you know health and well-being staff that had the training that, it, that there was a real um effort in extra care to, to to make that training accessible to a whole range of staff including you know people who worked in in marketing you know in in headquarters and so on and and they all said that you know how that had given them a much greater appreciation of the kinds of things uh, that residents are going through when they move uh, to the villages because quite often people are moving you know having um, experienced a, a bereavement because they can they can no longer live on their own so so that made you know a huge difference across a, a wide range of staff uh, in in the villages and the training was likewise very highly rated amongst volunteers uh, and uh, and residents alike and I think there were quite a few things that came out of that uh, evaluation of the training. This, and I think, you know, things, a few things that were striking. I think that it sort of led to a, a much wider understanding of loss, not just death related loss, but I think people were able to kind of frame the sort of losses that, you know, older people experience in those kinds of settings, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a form of, of, of bereavement without having, you know, without sort of overemphasizing the point I mean it's not you know not everything is experienced as a bereavement but they were able to kind of translate some of that learning about um, death related loss to the, the wider losses that people experience across the villages they I think and this 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 was this was for staff I think was was, was a huge you know one of the, the the huge benefits is that staff realize that it's okay to just listen right you don't have to you don't have to be there, you know, because because there's an awful lot of nervousness on the part of staff about how you actually speak to uh, people who, who are bereaved. And this allayed, you know, the training allayed an awful lot of fears uh, on that score and made people realise that it's OK to just listen. I think as one person put it, I can't remember the exact quote. It's like, you know, this realisation that not everything requires an action. You know, quite often the staff, you know, they, 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 they need to be seem to be kind of busy with residents, whatever their kind of needs are that they present. It requires, you know, normally an action uh, to go with it. But actually for bereavement, you know, just just listening and, and, and being silent is, is, is perfectly OK. So I think that was one big thing that we found and one one huge advantage of the training, the training. It's not ma mandatory for staff, and, and I think uptake was, was variable across the villages, but one of the recommendations that we've made on the back of the evaluation that the training is made mandatory uh, for all staff. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, uh, Eve. Yeah, I think one of the most striking bits of learning for the staff was about moving away from that solution-focused work. You know, we did a lot of work in the information sessions and the training to explain to staff that actually grief isn't something that you need to try and fix. You know, grief is a process, it's a journey. And actually, if somebody is upset when they're talking to you or maybe distressed when they're talking about a bereavement, that isn't something you need to try and almost fix in that half hour that you might have with that person. And actually it's quite healthy and it's okay if that person is upset and they're upset again on another occasion. And we did a lot of work to try and explain how grief can vary for different people, but also some of those key principles about not, not having a time frame, you know, and actually everybody grieving differently, not expecting everybody to have that same journey. And I think what Karen said as well about people understanding loss in a bit more holistic sense was really, really helpful because when we did the resident training, residents talked a lot about other types of loss, losses other than death related bereavement. So for example, they'd talk about things like, you know, I've, mo I've moved, um, and I've left my family home of 50 years, you know, and I've moved to a new area and I miss my church and I miss my doctor and, and I miss the community I lived in. And, and that was real grief for people. They were going on a journey to come to terms with that. You know, maybe they miss possessions because they've moved from a family house to a smaller apartment. And although they've made that choice to move, there's still an element of loss there. And particularly residents who'd had a real change in sort of health circumstances, you know, that loss they felt they'd been through. Um, for example, maybe loss of mobility was one that came up often. You know, maybe somebody couldn't drive anymore. Actually, that's a, a really fundamental loss um, to any of us. So I think understanding that people can grieve for those losses in the same or similar way that you can for bereavement was really helpful, particularly then when the pandemic happened, because I think there was a bit more of empathy, understanding, a bit more of a, actually, yeah, we're all experiencing some kind of loss now, because we did. We all experienced that kind of 
lost through lockdown, whether it was not being able to go to work or see family or friends, or even maybe at worst case that, you know, having a bereavement during that, that pandemic. So I do think that developed that kind of understanding and empathy because residents could see that other people were going through losses. And if they were bereaved, they could also see that they perhaps weren't the only one who's experienced some type of, some type of loss. Um, and we learned quite a lot through that, Karen, didn't we? We learned that some people actually who were grieving found the pandemic almost quite helpful because it gave them permission to step back, to grieve, not to socialise, not to have to put on a smile, because actually the pandemic forced them to kind of stop and take stock. For other people, it was extremely hard. You know, they were isolated from family and friends. They couldn't go and use their normal kind of social networks or enjoyable activities to help um, them to help them grieve or to help with that restoration following grief. So we saw we saw quite a mixed mixed picture, but I do think running through all of that was a, a general empathy that actually we're all we're all grieving and a bit more of an understanding what that might feel like. Would you, would you agree, Karen? Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Yeah. Okay, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about some of the outcomes for the volunteers, so the peer volunteers themselves, because we did a lot of work to understand their experience, didn't we, as well? Yeah, we did. So, so for the volunteers, you know, this is this is clearly a sort of higher higher level volunteering opportunity that enables people with sort of counselling skills to you know to bring those to the fore. Although the program wasn't aimed at that kind of person necessarily. I mean, the, the volunteer program is open to any resident. It was striking that the volunteers that came forward, at least in the first wave had those kinds of listening skills so they, they'd either been in the sort of caring professions or uh, we had people who were um, yeah, um, vicars and, and vicars wives, uh, people who'd worked in drug and alcohol dependency counselling uh, and that kind of thing so for that for those kinds of residents this is you know this was a real opportunity to to bring those skills that they'd acquired in their kind of professional lives uh, into their kind of voluntary uh, life which 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 is great because you know there are a range of volunteering opportunities across the villages but I think you know this is this is a very challenging uh, opportunity a high higher level uh, opportunity of, of, of volunteering let's say but I think I think there's there's a slight downside to that as well which we, we we've, we've kind of alluded to in that some people who, who felt that, you know, they, they were bringing those kind of qualifications to bear on the volunteering role were slightly frustrated, I think, on occasion that they weren't sort of, you know, having sort of formal referrals from the care staff um, of uh, residents in need of bereavement support and that often, you know, the support that they were giving was, was more ad hoc. And it comes back to this point again that we made earlier that often, you know, they did they 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 saw that kind of support as maybe a little bit trivial or not not worth recording or, you know, not quite understanding that that actually it was in the nature of the program that support would be like that often. It wouldn't be about sort of you know referrals in a kind of conventional sort of counselling uh, sense. So I think there's a there's an upside. Uh, to you know the high level skills of the volunteers but there, but there's a downside uh, as well but definitely you know a very uh, rewarding volunteer uh, experience and uh, staff you know clearly have, have benefited from this in the ways that uh, even I've already outlined so it's not you know I won't I won't repeat that uh, here but obviously in terms of the, the training that they, they they've received and their ability to you know, feel comfortable about talking to residents, experiencing uh, bereavement, uh, and so on, and how and how to communicate with them, or even not communicate, uh, has been um, a really uh, important uh, outcome. In terms of support recipients, I, I think it's fair to say that our data is somewhat more limited uh, in this regard, uh, partly because of, because of the pandemic. But I think what the diaries did, albeit from the perspective of the volunteers rather than the support recipients, recipients directly, but I think the diaries indicated that the volunteer support was crucial uh, to residents during the pandemic in the ways that even I have already uh, have already uh, outlined. So the volunteers really sort of taking the initiative to look after those residents or look out for those residents who were uh, in need of support. 
But residents have quite clearly benefited, general residents, not just residents who've directly had the kind of support of a resident bereavement supporter, but residents in general uh, who've gone to the information and awareness sessions quite clearly state in the, in the, in the feedback um, that we've had from those sessions that they're much more aware of the issues and, and, and where to go to uh, for support. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Eve. Um, I, was just, I was just going to say a colleague of awesome. mine yeah. from Extra Care, um, together we delivered a lot of those information and awareness sessions. And it was really striking how many people came along to those sessions and actually shared quite personal stories about their own bereavement, their own history of bereavement, some of which were from quite a long time ago, you know, in early adulthood or even childhood. And often said, actually, sometimes it was the first time they'd ever spoke to anybody really about that experience. Um, you know, and how that felt. And it was really, I think what was really interesting is an awareness that actually that's really healthy and doesn't necessarily mean then that somebody needs to go on and have a professional service. You know, people felt they were able to come, share, talk, find other services if they needed it. But also I had various residents say to me that they just felt lighter for having, having come along and been able to talk and be able to be heard. And that was enough. You know, that was almost enough for them in that, in that point in their life. Um, particularly powerful when you have people who, who talk about childhood and bereavement they had in childhood, because if you think generationally, quite often those bereavements were at a time culturally where we didn't talk at all about bereavement, or we were encouraged not to. We were told that, you know, keep calm and carry on. Let's not mention that. Let's not upset ourselves. Let's not, let's not, um, you know, let's not talk about that again. And I had residents talk to me about siblings that had had died when they were children and the family had never spoke about the, the sibling ever again because it was decided that that was the way to cope, you know, not to mention it, to, to sort of ignore almost that that had occurred. So I think by having different ways that we could open up this conversation, because we had information and awareness sessions, we did coffee mornings, we did art workshops, we did poetry workshops. There's lots of different ways that people could engage in a way that was comfortable for them. I think some residents actually surprised themselves that they they did open up in that way, but they, you know, they perhaps weren't planning to, but actually felt, felt that they could. Um, and we talked a lot about the different emotions involved in grief and not only the emotions, but how it affects us physically, cognitively, how grief is so holistic. It can affect all part, parts of us, including how we think, how we feel. Um, and that, those sessions were really insightful because residents would often talk about things like guilt or regret. And it was really helpful to normalize that and to talk about it and say that that's okay maybe you feel guilty about that or that you regret that that that's okay it's an allowed feeling you know it might be painful but it's it's okay that you feel that way and, and talking about it in a way that can help normalize some of those really really difficult difficult sort of emotions I think the biggest thing that came out as well is what Karen said that changing what to say culture you know people you know we were really keen that people felt more comfortable talking to a brief person that, and instead of maybe avoiding the person or avoiding the topic at all, that they felt able to give condolences or to just speak to the, you know, speak to the person without worrying about finding the right words. And most people came on the train and that was one of their kind of objectives. Most people said, I really want to learn what to say because I always feel like I'm going to say the wrong thing or I don't know what to say or I'll say nothing. Um, and at this point it might be useful as well just to talk a little bit more about those residents um, that we work with that were living with dementia. So in extra care, um, there'll be a number of residents who, who live with dementia and then there'll be residents who don't live with dementia, like you'd find in any community, you know, in a neighbourhood as such. So we did a lot of work early on to try and understand some of the challenges that people were facing, because there wasn't an awful lot at the time, resource-wise, in terms of grief and dementia. So there's another project that crews have in Wales where they developed a resource booklet around grieving, bereavement and dementia to break some of those myths around um, common myths like someone with dementia can't grieve, which we know isn't true. We know, we know dementia affects people in, in different ways, but actually even when someone's cognition is affected, you know, one of the last things that will be affected is the way that they feel, you know, the emotional side of the brain. So we talked, we talked to residents and also carers and we developed some resources around that. And one of the things that came out as a common challenge was staff or family or, or even other residents feeling that they weren't sure how to support a resident if the person was living with dementia and they had memory loss or they had confusion or cognition issues as part of their symptoms. You know, so what do you do if somebody can't remember that somebody's died? 
what do you do if somebody asks repeatedly where that person is, but actually we, we know they died some time ago? So we developed um, a fact sheet, some resources with real life examples of how those types of situations um, could be managed and help to raise awareness that actually somebody with dementia can still grieve and it's about how we support them in the grief. And we also did work with carers. So people, not paid carers, but family or friends who are looking after somebody who's living with dementia. So it could be husband and wife or, you know, or, or family friend as such. And we developed some resources there around the kind of losses that carers were, were experiencing. Carers, but also the person with dementia. So maybe after diagnosis, maybe a loss around something like not being able to drive anymore, or maybe not being able to do certain activities together or having to do them in a different way. And those sorts of losses, again, that can all trigger a grief reaction, but aren't necessarily related to somebody, somebody dying. So I mean, I'm quite happy to share quite a lot of the, well, any of the resources that we've developed, because we have got quite a lot of sort of fundamental information there, quite comprehensive information about dementia and bereavement, and obviously happy to take a question on that as well. Um, just conscious of time. So to keep to time, should we round off, Karen, just one last question, if that's okay? Sure. Yeah. yeah, so should we just think about if there's any other wider impacts that we don't think have been covered yet and what we've discussed? Yeah, so so, so in terms of sort of developing grief literacy uh, across the villages, I think, you know, the training has obviously been hugely beneficial there. But I, but I think it's, you know, this is, this is a work in progress, most definitely. You know, we've talked about the kind of cultural context of death, dying and, and bereavement. And, you know, that sometimes the, the kind of taboos and the uncertainties and the, and, and the nervousness around opening up conversations around death, dying and bereavement. I think this has been a really important step in opening up those conversations, the, the resident bereavement uh, supporter programme. And I think that the, uh, the volunteers, you know, because, because they are people who have kind of, you know, experience, prior kind of professional experience as well. I think they've, they've been the ones who've been really at the kind of forefront of challenging some of these kind of more uh, entrenched uh, practices and, and hopefully uh, will we'll continue, continue to do so. Um, that's really, I think, all I wanted to say in addition to what we've already said, uh, Eve. Um, I don't know if you've got anything to add. Thanks, Karen. Um, I think from a cruise point of view as well, we've learned probably a lot through the evaluation of the project about how to work with communities. You know, actually how to work at that kind of, as Karen showed in a presentation, that, that first level, you know, where you can help to raise awareness, um, share information, signpost, and actually that type of support that most people in a community will need following a bereavement. So we've learned a lot about how we can work with communities and upskill communities and empower people as well, and, and some of the challenges with that. So it's been a really useful um, piece of learning for us at Cruise in terms of thinking about future practices and services. Um, I think it's definitely left some legacy where there is a different type of culture in extra care about talking about death, dying and bereavement. Obviously that takes time and we'll need to continue, but we've definitely seen a, a kind of shift um, to those sort of open conversations, which sits so well with the, the work that they're doing around end of life and people being able to live well until the end of life. Um, and then also for us, I think moving forward, we've learned around a lot of the challenges around peer support and actually the support that peer supporters themselves might need, some of the things that we need to put into place to help support them and enable them to be able, be able to do that. But also sometimes how professionals sometimes need to step back and allow people to be able to sort of self-organize and do some of these activities as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably, um, in a nutshell, the additional impacts from us. So we're quite happy, I think, to finish at that point, Karen, in terms of our presentation, aren't we? And, and hand, back to, hand back to Emily for any discussion or questions. Great. Yes, thank you.